Tonight, we are welcoming Burke from Service Photo in Baltimore. Um, I'm gonna let him talk about his business and his industry tonight. If you guys, I'm telling you, I've been to his store a couple of times. If you think you wanna buy stuff from people out of state, like in New York, try them first, because I was very fortunate enough to call him one day and I was like, I'm looking for this Sigma 105. And he's like, as a matter of fact, you know what? It just came in today. <laughs> So I zoomed to Baltimore and got it. So I'm gonna with that. I'm gonna just give it over to Burke and have him talk about um, his business and what they've been around, what they do. Now, service has been around since 1948. Uh, they're in Baltimore, and from there, I'll let him tell the rest of the story. So Burke, go ahead. Well, great, Danny. Thanks so much for having me tonight. Um, I really appreciate the opportunity. Um, and and you know, really, I don't prepare anything when, when I talk to photographers in a situation like this, because this is what I live and do every single day and have for a really long time. So um, please feel free to stop me anytime and ask me questions about anything, um, not photographically related, but the industry. That's what I'm all about. I'm not a photographer. I am surrounded by photographers every direction I look, different types of photographers. But me, myself, um, I've, I've tried and I'm just not very good. And that's because I don't have the time or the energy to devote to it. Um, but together with, with my business and industry experience and all these photographers that I'm surrounded with, the goal is that we bring our customers who are all photographers, um, you know, uh, some knowledge along with a lot of assistance and, and personal service and things. So I'll give you a brief history of my business. And this is going to sound familiar as I'm looking at the list here. I know Mr. Ferry and Mr. Anderson will, will absolutely relate to this um, because uh, I bought my business service photo in 1991. Uh, it was a business that had been around since 1948. Um, and, you know, growing up, I didn't know what I wanted to do when I grew up, but I knew what I didn't want to do. And what I didn't want to do was I didn't want to own a camera store because it was in my family. And I saw that, you know, owning a business is a 24 hour a day job. Uh, when you wake up, you're thinking about working. When you're, when you put your head down on your pillow at night, you're thinking about something uh, of the business is related. When you're on vacation, you're thinking about something in your business. So it wasn't something that I was interested in, but um, when I came home after, uh, after leaving a job, uh, kind of a wall street finance type thing, I started working at Service Photo and I saw a business that was being run horribly, um, but one where the customers were great and they really liked what they were doing. And I saw a lot of potential. And back then, Baltimore had, I think, probably 10 camera stores at least. Um, and Maryland probably had 20 camera stores. And there, you know, camera stores were everywhere because taking pictures. Um, was a hobby or a profession or just an, a, 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 something that people like to do as part of their everyday uh, lives. And you know, it was all about film and developing and there were camera stores everywhere. Um, but when I purchased Service Photo, my goal was to turn it into a, a professional camera store because at the time, the stores were all mini labs, you know, with frames and albums and a and little bit of this, a little bit of that. And, and, and selling cameras was almost like, a, like an afterthought, um, but it was what made the world go around. And, and people used a ton of film, but they couldn't get film at a decent price in Maryland um, because, you know, God forbid, you know, somebody make a profit on something. And, and, and these were small stores that needed to make a profit. So it really didn't kind of mesh with what professional photographers wanted, which was higher volume, lower prices, better service. And oh, you got to have all the stuff in stock all the time. Um, if I've got a wedding on you know, Saturday and I need to buy some film, you can't say you're out of it. It's, it, it's got to happen. So, so this was just a, a, a different thing. And, and that's what I wanted to create, um, uh, a professional camera store. And uh, we went through 10 really, really difficult years um, uh, financially because I was coming from a place where we were starting from ground zero. Uh, again, buying a business that was just really run into the ground. Service Photo used to be three stores. I bought one store and um, let the previous owner, who was my father, um, and we, we kind of 
went head to head. We did not, this was not a, a pleasant family transition. Um, we kind of thought that the other one would be out of business in a few years. And my father who had stores in uh, one, another one in Baltimore and one in Towson was out of business in three years, unfortunately. And here, here we are today at Service Photo, um, still kicking. Um, the transition was very, very um, interesting and time consuming. Um, but we, we worked with a lot of professional organizations of ASMP, which I'm sure you've all heard of, the American Society of used to be magazine photographers and now it's media photographers. And then we worked with the uh, Maryland PPA and some other groups. Um, very different types of photographers at that time, although I don't think the same is true today. Um, back then, ASMP was um, all about commercial photographers. These, these folks shot uh, for schools, they shot for publications, they shot for annual reports, um, they shot interiors and exteriors for architects and home builders and things like that. Um, they primarily shot chrome film, um, not too much negative at all. We sold a lot of eight by 10 film, four by five film, tons of medium format film and 35 millimeter film. Um, I did the math once and I think we sold 10,000 rolls a week on average in our heyday for, per year on a, on a year basis. So 10,000 rolls of film per week. Um, we were in an area that was surrounded by labs. So if you came to Baltimore, you had five labs within a two block area all around our store. Um, and that made it very convenient. Our store was filled with refrigerators. Um, we sold a lot of film out of those refrigerators. Um, the Maryland PPA group of photographers was very different from the ASMP photographers. They were primarily, and, and, and I would tell you, um, Mr. Ferry or uh, David, correct me whenever I'm wrong, but if we go back into the 90s, it seemed like the majority of the PPA photographers in Baltimore or the surrounding area were portraits, um, weddings, events, and a little bit of commercial. Would that be fair to say is, is fairly accurate? Yeah, yes. it sounds um, pretty accurate. Uh, I might be a little different from the norm because I did quite a bit of commercial photography also. Uh, uh, I did photography for Mobile Oil as an example for about seven years. Uh, not not full time, but just on a contract basis. Gotcha. But you know, so so when we were uh, when we had refrigerators filled with film, all of our chrome film primarily went to slide film, went to commercial photographers, but we had cases upon cases of uh, 120 and 35 millimeter uh, VPS and later portrait films. Um, and they came 300 rolls to a case and it was not uncommon for a photographer uh, to purchase 300 rolls at a time. And maybe that 300 rolls was um, a week Maybe it was a month. Um, maybe it was every couple months. Maybe who knows? But but it, basically, the PPA photographers, for the most part, were negative film shooters. If we had to characterize them, um, and the ASMP photographers were, were Chrome slide film shooters, um, and it was two very similar yeah. yet very different groups. So it was it was yeah. very very interesting. And of course, that has transitioned completely because not only is everyone digital, but I think that the groups have evolved where there's a lot more diversity um, within those groups. Um, back in the day, we, uh, we had a lot of sponsorship and a lot of assistance from companies like Kodak and Fuji. And when the PPA had their uh, annual uh, convention, which was typically on the coldest day in January back in the 90s, usually about a week before Super Bowl because, or two weeks before Super Bowl, because I always remember missing really good playoff football games. Um, uh, you know, Kodak would be there and, and Fuji, Harry Markle from Fuji would always be there uh, with, with great, you know, free stuff and prizes and, and all kinds of stuff. And, and, you know, those days are completely gone. Um, and so, you know, there's just been such a transition um, from say the year 2000, when the, when the digital switch happened to now. Um, during that time, the, the, the emphasis has shifted away from soft goods like film to hard goods. It is your, your, your camera and your lenses, and of course your eye and, and your skills and talent that make the images. Um, 
and all your post processing with whatever, whatever uh, software that you use. But that was not always the case. Um, it was really, there was a lot to do with film back in the day and then it transitioned into equipment. And what happened because of that is labs went out of business and struggled a lot faster than they had anticipated. So as soon as volume went down about 20%, 25%, what we saw were a lot of lab failures because they were very highly leveraged. All the photo labs around Maryland um, basically had all of this great expensive equipment to produce volume uh, work and it was all leased and they were making their monthly payments, but every other dollar went to paying their staff because they had large staff um, in, in each of these labs. And as soon as the volume went down, um, they couldn't make their payments. And so we saw labs um, that were very successful. Um, they, they just deteriorated very, very quickly. And I do believe that that um, made the transition to digital a little bit faster because the labs weren't offering the same level of service or the same level of consistency or the same level of quality. So we saw um, in, in the Baltimore area for sure, a lot more people who thought that they would not go digital maybe ever or for a long time, they gave it a try. And, and for a good 10 years, um, you almost had to get every new camera that came out because you were going from a two megapixel to a four, to a six, to an eight. And, and then, you know, I remember when they came out with a 10 megapixel camera, someone said, what else could they possibly ever do? Who would want anything else? But during that 10 year period, we were doing a lot of, um, you know, camera upgrades constantly. We were, we were uh, switching people from film cameras to uh, digital cameras for the first time and then upgrading them and switching brands. You know, Nikon did not have a full frame camera for a good four or five years after, um, after Canon had come out with one. So I cannot tell you the amount of conversions that we switched to Canon because people really needed that full frame capability um, for this new technology. And they paid $10,000 for a six megapixel camera or an eight megapixel camera. It was unbelievable. Um, the, the, the costs were, were, were unreal. But what that did for us was it kind of... Um, cemented us into the, 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 the camera world where we had been really film-based and we did sell lots of equipment in the, in, in the past, lots of four by five, Hasselblad, Sinar, Nikon, Canon, but now we were almost exclusively doing equipment. Um, lots of trade-ins. So we, we started getting very, very active with used cameras um, because if you take it in, you've got to take it someplace and sell it. Um, and then we, we, really enhanced our relationships with all the camera manufacturers. And slowly but surely, we went from four refrigerators in our store to three, to two, to one, and then to zero refrigerators. Um, and you know, uh, there was a need for a refrigerated film back then. People needed good quality and consistency, but no more. So now what we saw was people really, really loving gear and, and just really getting into the whole workflow of digital. At the same time, uh, a lot of the other stores uh, were faltering. Baltimore once had 16 Ritz camera stores just in, in town and in the suburbs. Um, Ritz camera had over a thousand stores nationwide. Um, we all know they're out of business today. Um, and what happened was the photo lab wasn't needed anymore. And the photo lab was where the money was made. Selling those frames and albums, that's where the money was made. If you went to a professional photo show up in New York or anywhere, who had the nicest booth? Leather craftsmen. They paid thousands and thousands of dollars just to have a guy with a baby grand piano and a tuxedo play while you walked through their booth and perused their, you know, three, four, five hundred dollar albums. That was kind of going away um, to a great degree. So things were changing really, really fast. Um, and we saw camera stores struggling. Meanwhile, we were doing okay because we didn't have a lab. We never had a lab. Um, it, it, the, the, the consumer mini lab or professional lab business was, was tough. And I just never, luckily, never wanted any part of it. Um, and, and Baltimore really had its fair share of them. So I, I felt the market was saturated. So we stayed away. And that really 
really truly helped us. Um, so we we come into the the say the the early first decade of the of the new uh, century, and digital is progressing pretty quickly. Um, and then we we started to see it slow down. And with that slowdown, we saw the last few other camera stores go out of business. Unfortunately, you know, I take no no um, no no glee in seeing other camera stores go out of business. It's it's very very unfortunate because it just means that the marketplace isn't supporting our businesses as much as as we need them to. Um, the last really good chain of camera stores that went out of business um, in Maryland was Pen Camera. Um, that was January 4th, 2012. I remember the day exactly, because when I heard the news, I just, I couldn't believe it. Um, they were a juggernaut and they had eight stores. Had they probably kept it at a, two or three stores, they might still be in business today. But they, again, they had eight stores with eight labs um, and the overhead was incredible. So, um, you know, Ritz Camera had a thousand stores with a thousand labs and they didn't own one single piece of property. Everything was rented. Um, if you look at the stores that are still out there today, um, and there are perhaps 90 specialty camera stores in the United States right now. Um, so definitely less than 100. Um, and then you've got some, some big players. You will see that most of the successful camera stores have one location. Some have two. I know one guy who owns Hunt's Photo up in, up in Boston. He's got eight stores and he is like one of the last multi-location dealers that is very successful. Um, and there's a place called Mike's Camera out in Boulder, uh, Colorado. And they've got, I think, 10 stores in Northern California and Colorado. And between Mike's and Hunt's, they're the last two multi-chain stores. Really, everyone's got one or two stores. Um, and the people that are out there right now operating camera stores across the country are um, not only really good people, but they're 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 doing a great they're doing great stuff for photographers right now. Um, what I will tell you is that roughly seventy percent of all cameras and lenses in the United States right now are um, those three places are B and H, Best Buy, and Amazon. Everyone else, including Adorama. And our what we call the specialty photo channel, which is 90 stores, um, and then places like Target and Walmart uh, that that do sell you know some cameras. We all split the remaining 30 percent, um, and so you know we're we're very fortunate for all the business that we get, and we're trying to do whatever we can to serve those within the region. Um, the last year has been extremely interesting um, because we were forced to shut down for eight weeks. Uh, legally, we could not operate our business. Of course, I was there every day, legal or not. Um, I could, couldn't answer the phones, but I, um, I answered emails and I, I delivered products as much as I could. I, I took products to a UPS terminal and, and shipped them out to people. I, I did allow people to pick up things at our real rear loading dock whenever you know they were wanted to venture out. But it's it, it's been an, an interesting time. But what this year has pretty much allowed us to do is get to know photographers that we didn't know before. They're local. They're within the state of Maryland. They're regional, but they never knew about us before because you know quite honestly they were B and H shoppers or they were you know Best Buy shoppers, um, and. That's still happening today. You know, right now, um, not a day goes by when we don't meet someone who said, you know, I never knew you guys were here. Um, but that you go looking for things and, and right now you can't find them, unfortunately. I don't know if, if any of you have been shopping for cameras or lenses recently, but there's a huge demand for photography uh, equipment right now. And that's because, uh, Photography is one of the biggest hobbies uh, and, and enth the enthusiast market for photography gear is absolutely huge. Um, they've got, you know, no problem on, on you know, uh, paying for things and they, they, they read the reviews and they go out and they see what their friends are doing. You go up to Conowingo Dam sometime in, in Harford County or Cecil County 
and you see what these guys have, it's you, you can you can go up there and there's a million dollars worth of equipment on a, on a busy day sitting there taking pictures of eagles. I mean, it's incredible. Um, but there's the camera companies are all having great difficulties um, getting products to the marketplace this year. Um, and what that means is that, you know, you go to B&H's website and you will, I, I know I've never seen so many coming soon signs and, you know, we expect it in two to four weeks type of thing. Then I, I've never seen that before um, because Sony, Nikon, Canon, and Fuji are the, the own pretty much 95% of the marketplace for, for cameras and lenses. And um, they're just very, very challenged right now due to semiconductors and components, whether it be a small component or a large component, just sourcing all these components to make these new products and get them to the marketplace um, is really, really hard. So, you know, we're kind of all in this together. Uh, we, we really want to help photographers as, as much as we can. Um, and sometimes the biggest help we can do is have it in stock. So that, that's what my goal is all day long. That's what I do behind the scenes. I'm constantly working with um, the, the, the vendors, our, our vendors very much, very closely. Um, I'm calling in, you know, 30 years of, of chits because I've, I've tried to have a good relationship with them for so many years. And now I'm calling on that to get us more supplies so that we can Um, you know, you called looking for a new lens. It was probably what a year, year or more ago. Um, we didn't have that new lens in stock, but I had just bought the used lens and the used lens pretty much looked like a new lens. And so that was a pretty, that was a pretty cool thing. It, we, we got lucky. Um, and that was just when all the stars aligned, but that's the kind of thing that, uh, we really like doing for photographers, you know, um, just, something that we can bring to the table that say a B and H can't, um, you know, spending time with people explaining uh, the gear and trying to help them learn how to use it best, not being a photographer and looking at all the photographers out there that we serve. Um, it is my opinion that there's no right nor no wrong in photography. Um, you know, there are rules uh, and, but you, and, and so, you might not win that print competition if that print competition is based on certain rules. But when I say there's no right or no wrong with photography, it's what's right for you. You know, what camera or lens makes you happy? What feels good in your hand? What makes your clients happy? Um, you know, what does the job? It's not the same set of rules for any two photographers, as far as I can tell. It's, it's pretty close sometimes, but it's a very individual type of thing. So we like working with those individuals um, because it teaches us something new every day. Um, right now I've got 14 people employed. Um, I would say all but two or three are photographers and you know, we're there to help and that's what we want to do. Um, and uh, you know, hopefully I think we bring a little something to the table that's different. Um, I find it very odd to say that we are Maryland's only camera store. Um, but we are, if you classify a camera store as someplace that buys, sells, rents, and repairs cameras. Um, and, and that's a big deal. So that's pretty much the history of kind of where, where we've been, um, for the last 30 years this year on April 1st, it was my 30th anniversary of owning the store. So, um, I've actually got, I think five people that have work there the whole time too. So, so we've got a staff that people know and, um, you know, trying to help photographers as best we can. So that, that's pretty much it in a nutshell. Um, I would like to, you know, answer any questions that anybody might have. I mean, um, about anything. Uh, you know, in, about the industry. I am happy to, you, no one can offend me. Um, no one can, can surprise me usually. Um, so any, any questions that anybody have about, might have about buying gear, um, 
you know, instant rebates, you know, why do they, why does, why does a camera company do this? Why does a camera company do that? Why, what's this all about? What's that? I'm, I'm more than happy to shed any light and, and, and answer any questions. So my, my question to you is, I know that you and I, <clears throat> with that uh, Sigma lens, you do sell used gear. So could you just tell our members about how that program works? If you want to, do you also purchase used gear? All day long. So how does so that work? That, that, it's, it's, you know, I stopped asking people why they bring gear to us because sometimes the answers aren't very good. Like somebody died or there's a divorce or something. But the fact is we get, some unbelievably great used gear traded into us or sold to us um, for all kinds of reasons. And believe me, some of it's so awesome. You want to ask, what are you doing getting rid of this? It just doesn't make sense. Um, we also get some old vintage stuff. And then we get a lot of in between. Um, you know, I cannot tell you in the last three or four years, how many people have switched systems, whether it's Canon to Sony or Nikon to Canon or Canon to Nikon. It goes every which way. So Number one, um, we get our used equipment from a lot of different sources. Um, we get estates. Uh, there are people that are just nuts about cameras. You know, you probably know someone that loves golf and they'll spend every last nickel on golf and every last minute, hour, day, whatever they've got, every last penny and every last minute on golf because they love golf. Well, the same is true about photography. People just love the gear. When someone passes away or, or it gets sick and they, they can't use their gear anymore, um, we, we buy it. Um, so we, we do get a lot of gear from that, um, but we get even more gear from trade-ins. Most people are buying a new lens. Um, and, you know, the, the 150 to 600 zoom lens for, for shooting wildlife um, you know, Tamron came out with a new G2. So let me give you my old one. And so I. Or I'm not switching to mirrorless, but I want a D850. Um, and, uh, you know, I want to I want to trade up. So we do a lot of trade ins. The reality is. The people listening to this know a lot of other photographers. So you can sell your gear directly to other photographers um, who you know, and that's the best way to get the most money, quite honestly. I do not recommend like a Facebook marketplace or a Craigslist or even an eBay, only because number one, some of them are unsafe like Craigslist. Some of them are just completely unreliable like Facebook and with eBay, you're going to pay some fees. You will sell your gear, but you're going to pay some fees. Um, what I tell people is chances are I make life real easy because my checks never bounce. I always give people either new gear or, or checks. And, um, you know, we clearly are happy to tell people exactly what we think the gear is going to pay for when you do a trade in. So that way, if you don't want our deal, you're going to walk away with knowing exactly what all the gear is worth and what you might ask for it. Um, and because it's, it's not a perfect science. Each piece of gear is unique and it might have a different value. We might have six of the same item in our cases and they might have six different prices. Um, and it's because each piece is unique. So we're happy to give people as much information as possible, but it's kind of difficult to do it over the phone or via an email. We really need to see the gear and touch it and inspect it and test it. We'll get a shutter count. We do all that kind of stuff. So, so we help facilitate that at the end of the day. If you had sold your gear on eBay or whether you had sold it to us, chances are we would have gotten you 90% of what you would have put in your pocket anyway, or more. Um, because we're not going to, our fees are a little bit different, but we do have fees, but we make it very, very easy. You don't have to ship the gear. You don't have to photograph it and list it. You don't have to do any of that. We're going to, we're going to facilitate it all for you and write you a check on the spot or facilitate your trade on the spot. Um, but you absolutely can get more if you sell it yourself. Um, that's, that's for sure. But we do so much of it. And um, the, the, the good thing is so much of it is hardly ever used. I, I always remember taking in a Nikon D800 
for a guy that just had to be first on the list to get the Nikon DA-10. And he was first on the list and he did get his DA-10 first. And as he traded in his D-800, that was three years old, I did a shutter count on it and he had taken 89 pictures with that camera. <laughs> and those were 89 very expensive pictures for him. <laughs> um, and I explained it to him. And, and the reality is, you know, you got to make this camera gear pay for itself or you, you got to just really get a lot of enjoyment out of it. So you're supposed to use it, but not everybody does. So, um, you know, we're there to help people uh, with, with all of their used stuff. And, and for me, it's a lot of fun because I have one other buyer, Chuck, that I work with. Um, and then I do a lot of the buying myself. And it's the one thing that every day is different. Um, in a world where our work is not different all, all every day, that keeps it fresh and, and it's always something new. And it's, it's, for me, it's a lot of fun. It's one, one of the things I enjoy most. So, so Burke, when people come to your website, is it like one of the bigger stores where you could order off of your website and you'll ship it to people? I mean, do you ship stuff from your store? All day long. So the reality is, when you do $10 million of business a day, like B&H does, um, you can afford one of the best websites in the world. Um, it's, not the, it's not the best looking, but it's so functional. It's absolutely incredible. And I don't know anybody that would disagree with that. Um, and, and it just makes it really, really easy. The reality for us is we will never have a website that good. Our website is perhaps better than mediocre. Um, it's, it's functional but it's not as good as theirs because so much of our business is done in store because people want to come. The attraction for a business like ours is to come and put your hands on it. I'm, going, I'm about to make a big purchase. I want to touch it. I want to feel it. I want to learn about it and make sure it is the right thing. So that's why people come to us, um, which is nice. But in this day and age of COVID, people will definitely... Um, you know, I need a memory card. I don't want to go out. Um, you know, I need a roll of background paper that I want to go pick up at the store. But let me just buy it online so I know that they have it and they reserve it for me. Um, so we do a lot of curbside pickup right now. We do a lot of on uh, in-store pickup for our website. Right. And we do ship. Um, we Everything on our website is shipped free. Well, at least it was until about three weeks ago because as people around the country were running out of stock and running out of products, what we were getting was kids, I say kids, millennials, young people who were buying one roll of film and they found a camera and they wanted to shoot one roll of film and they wanted me to ship it to California. And that became a problem because I had to ship it for free. It cost me more to ship than the roll of film cost. So anything under 50 bucks, we actually charge $10 a ship, but anything over $50 is shipped free. Um, and you know, I would tend to say that two or 3% of our business is online. Um, but, uh, but most of it is done in, in the store because people really, really want to see it from us. So, so that's another reason why we don't have this super duper website, but it's, it's kind of, it, it's kind of a nice functional website. And, you know, a couple of things that we do on our website is all of our rentals. We do a lot of gear rentals. That is 100% reserved on our website. Um, and we, we publish a used list. We try and change the list every two weeks that shows people what our used inventory is. The reality is the best way to get current availability is to call because our stock is different every day, but it's, it's changing so often we can't really put it on our web. So we publish a list um, and those are the two things that our website really, really helps us with, as well as just letting people know that we're out there. Um, our website is easily found. And, um, you know, if you're going to refer somebody to someone, you just go to servicephoto.com. It's really easy. Um, and, uh, you know, people can contact us. I get, no lie, I get hundreds of emails a day, probably 150 to 200 of them are ones that I have to answer. And they come from our website questions about sensor cleaning or lens calibration that we provide, um, questions about camera repairs, questions about rentals, um, about do you have this in stock? Do you have that in stock? What do you do? Um, you know, I get 10 questions a day. Do, you know, do you develop film? Do you have a lab? So I refer people to other businesses um, all the time. Um, 
really everybody in our industry right now works together. So I am more than happy to refer somebody someplace else because people refer customers to us all day long. So it's, 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 it's a nice thing. So speaking of that, uh, who do you refer people to for uh, film processing? Because I get people all the time asking me about uh, even these uh, disposable cameras and so forth. Well, in, in Baltimore, there's two places. So one of them is called Full Circle on 21st Street um, near, the, near the train station in Baltimore. And they are, the name of their business is Full Circle Fine Art Services because they do a little bit of everything. They have a gallery, they do framing they do film developing, they do digital restoration, they do all kinds of stuff. And, and I will tell you, and I don't have any personal experience, very little personal experience utilizing their services. But what I hear is that uh, they do a great job with everything they do. Um, and they're probably not the least expensive option, um, but, but they do a great job. So depending on what you need, I think that's usually my first go-to a referral. There's another place in Baltimore called National Photo, and they're over on Reisterstown Road in Pikesville. And a guy, Lev Barev, owns it, and he's owned it for a long time. And he's a really good guy. He's very personable, and you can go in and talk to him. And he's got a lab there. Um, he does all types of stuff. Um, he's a little bit more into production work rather than, say, a fine art services. So he's probably a little less expensive. But as far as I know, those are the only two labs in Baltimore and the surrounding area. Now, I, I know DC has, I think it's, is it Dodge Chrome or someplace like that? And, and, and what's the other place? He's a, he's a PPA member, Pilot, Pilot Imaging. Yeah, um, yeah. But other than that, there's not, there's not a whole lot um, because uh, you know, there, there are mail order labs. Nation's Photo, another big lab in, uh, they're based in Hunt Valley. Um, but they're, they, they send work all over the country. Um, but, you know, the local lab where you actually walk in and deal with the person who's going to be printing or doing the work for you. Um, I don't want to say it's a thing of the past, but it's, it's kind of tough to find these days. Mm -hmm. This is, this is Vicki Gray. Um, uh, this talk has been great. It's been really informative. I've been dealing with service for years and years, but I didn't know your history. And um, I have, used Nation's Lab in Pikesville for a number of services. They do film developing, but they also do, they convert slides, they scan slides, they do, um, what do my sister had like old, like like 50 year old videos. Yeah, or they, what do they call them, you know, like 35 millimeter film. Right. And they converted it and, you know, gave me a DVD for her. When I, they do a lot, they do photo restoration, um, it's, and it, the owner will come out and talk to you, you know, like when you, you, most of the time he's in the back, you know, so the, the woman at the, at the register will check you in, but the owner will come out and deal with you. And they, so like, I recommend them for any kind of specialty, like photo handling or photo manipulation. And I, I've, I've used full circle for framing and I've been to their, to their, um, their shows a lot. I've not used them for um, film developing, but I agree with you. I'm sure they do an excellent job because they do a great job with everything. Yeah. And, and, and I will tell you that I hear, I, I hear complaints if there are complaints and I've never heard a complaint about the quality of either of those two places ever. So um, I also don't, but I don't hear, you know, when people are happy, they're not usually too vocal when people are unhappy, they're very vocal. So I've never really heard, um, any complaints, but I hear when people are happy and I, everybody's pretty much happy with both. So, Brooke, can you talk a little bit more about your camera repairs? Because you had mentioned that you do the camera repairs kind of briefly. If somebody comes up to you and says, hey, I want my sensor clean, is that a, an overnight thing or is it, can they wait for it? Can they go get a cup of coffee and come back? How's that work? A couple different ways. Well, sensor cleaning, and, and lens calibration are two things that we kind of keep separate from what we call repairs. Um, sensor cleaning is something that we do a next day service and we do a same day service. You know, the reality is that uh, our customers typically drive for 45 minutes to 90 minutes to come to our store. And we have to be very, very sensitive to that. And, and it's sometimes it's, it's really crazy and it's easy for us to forget 
that people are coming from such a long distance. Um, so we try and do things as quickly as possible. Uh, we do sensor cleanings same day or next day uh, and, and lens calibrations same day or next day. Now you don't need a lens calibration with a mirrorless camera, but with SLRs, your lenses can go in and out of calibration to do a little back focus, get a little soft. So imagine if you brought us three lenses and two cameras. Well, that's six calibrations if, you, if we calibrate each lens for each camera. So we have to keep that in mind. So we try and keep prices down. Um, lens calibrations are $39, sensor cleanings are $69, and we have events. Um, will we have an event this year? Probably not because um, not an in-store event while we do it while you wait because it brings too many people in. And as many people as would be happy with us for having an event, many people would be upset with us for having an event. So we'll probably offer some type of special where you drop it off and pick it up um, uh, and maybe just a price reduction because some people will want to wait for it as well. So yeah, you can go have lunch or a cup of coffee and get your sensor cleaned and your lenses calibrated. Um, repairs are a very interesting situation. Um, there's a guy up in Pikesville. Um, there's a place called Baltimore Photographic Electronic Services, BPES. Um, they're not authorized by any manufacturer to do anything for anybody, but he's a guy who is very nice and he's got an unbelievable selection of vintage junk parts all over the place. And he also buys things uh, online and he fixes vintage cameras. So if you've got something vintage that you need repaired, he's the guy to go to. Because if you ask me to repair something that's vintage, I have to tell you that there's no parts available. Um, and it's very difficult. Uh, there used to be a magazine called Shutterbug. You could open up the, the magazine, look in the back, and you'd find all these places that, that were like a specialist or Hasselblad specialist or whatever. But it's, it's getting a lot tougher these days. Um, if you have a Hasselblad camera and you want it repaired, chances are the person who's going to fix it used to work for Hasselblad. Chances are they're over 80 years old. Um, chances are it's going to take you three to four weeks to get it back because they don't work very quickly. And it's not going to cost you a little bit of money either. It's fairly expensive. So getting vintage things repaired is getting more and more difficult. Um, when it comes to current items, you know, you're a working professional. You have jobs to do. You need your equipment back in a reasonable amount of time and something's broken for whatever reason. It doesn't really matter. Um, there used to be plenty of places where you could send things to get fixed. Um, what happened with the transition to digital is things got a little bit more finely tuned. Um, these, these third party or authorized repair facilities were not doing a very good job. So Nikon, Canon, Sony, Fuji, all the major manufacturers decided to bring repairs back in-house. And it seems a little selfish and some people really don't like that idea, but um, what it's done is a couple of things. Number one, it's increased the price of your repair. So if you drop your camera, your camera just stops working and it's not in warranty of any type, it's going to be not an inexpensive proposition, unfortunately. And we have no control over that. But the good news is that it's going to be done right. Chances are it's going to be done right the first time. Um, Canon, Nikon, Fuji, Sony, they do not sell parts to anyone else. So if I have a little camera repair shop anywhere and I want to buy parts and be an authorized repair center, it's not happening. They keep all the parts for themselves and they do all the repairs themselves. So you can send your camera gear right to the manufacturer. If you're a Nikon NPS, Nikon Professional Services member, or a Sony Pro Services member, or a Canon Pro Services member, um, you will now pay for those services every year. It's not free. You don't get to sign up just because you're a professional photographer like you used to. You will pay. And part of the, the benefit of paying is that you'll get a faster turnaround on repairs. Um, but some people just don't feel like paying a couple hundred dollars or up to $500 a year for that privilege. Um, and they just kind of take a chance. So when your camera breaks, you can send it directly to the manufacturer. You go to their website, you click on the right tabs, send it up. You can do it all yourself. I will tell you, I don't think it's a good idea because I know that we can do it better. Um, of course, you have to come to our store. So maybe it's not that convenient for you. But if it's not inconvenient, my suggestion is to come to us. Why? Number one, we send stuff to them every single day. Every manufacturer, we send things to them every single day. So we group them all together. We're able, we have to charge for shipping, 
but it's less than if you went to the UPS store. It's less than if you went to Kinko's FedEx. And right now, I don't think anybody wants to put their nice expensive camera in a priority mail package with the US Postal Service. It's just not gonna get there in a reasonable amount of time. So you bring it to us, we send boxes up, we insure everything fully, we get them there very quickly. And I will tell you that as fast of a job as they do for you, which would be about two weeks individually, they do that job or a little bit faster for us. So we're gonna get you a little bit faster turnaround because we work with these people every day and we've got you know friends in good places, so to speak. The other thing is they're gonna charge you the list price. There's a price, this is what it costs. You don't want it, you get your camera back unrepaired. With us, it's the same thing, except there's a little bit of a discount because they give us a discount. We have to make a couple bucks, but we do discount it a little bit. So in, in the end, if you bring your camera repair to us, it'll get back a little bit faster. It'll cost a little bit less. And I have somebody that's been doing it again for 30 years. She tests every single piece before she picks up the phone to call you to tell you it's back. Um, so, you know, fixing a camera, opening one up in our store and fixing it, not going to happen. Too complicated. Um, but sending it off to the manufacturers, um, that's what we do. And that's what you can do. But Hopefully I explained the two processes fairly if, well. I mean, if it, we it, have, I'm, I'm sorry. Sure. Yeah. If we have Nikon professional services um, and we're at the paid level where there's a, a small discount for, um, uh, for service, does that, does that translate? Like if we, if we still let you ship it up for us and stuff, they will not let you do it. They okay. will not let us do it. We would love for you to come in and drop it off, but because okay. they're offering that to you, they want you to send it directly. Separately. Um, okay. If you're a Nikon professional services member in the paid level, at their highest level, they have something, it's $300 a year. Yeah, they have the something that allows you to get that $300 back. So if you buy a piece of equipment or any group of equipment um, within that year, um, all you have to do is scan, take your receipt and send it to Nikon. And, um, and you can scan it, you email it. Um, and they will contact us and we give you a credit. So what, so in, in th up to $300. So you pay $300 a year to be a Nikon professional services member. You can get your $300 back if you spend $3,000 in that year. So it's up to 10% of your purchase. So if you spend $2,000, you bought a new lens, it was $2,000, you get $200 back. Um, but what I do is when Nikon gives me that credit, I then give it to you a, if I give it to you, I can write you a check. Or if I give it to you in a gift card, I give you another 10%. So I give people $330 whenever they, you know, NPS members all the time. And it's kind of a nice little thing. You know, for us, it's like loyalty gets people back in the, in the store and that type of thing. But um, camera companies today have an eye on profitability. And that was not always the case. You know, Canon is the market share leader. They've got the biggest slice of the pie. Um, why? Because they lost money for years. Canon, Canon is a huge company. And, and the, the camera part of Canon is really, really small compared to you know, their entire company. So this was a money losing uh, subsidiary that helped them gain market share. So Canon became number one. Sony has creeped up on them in, uh, for the uh, last few years. Um, and quite honestly, Sony's a very big company too. And Cameras don't make them much money, but they're starting to eye up profitability a little bit more because they, they basically have to justify their existence. So that's why these services are no longer free. That's why you can't get Nikon to sponsor your, your annual convention for the PPA um, or anybody else. I mean, it, it's very difficult. Um, but you know, I'll take a, a, a small company like Nikon, um, which, is, which is very small compared to Canon or Sony. Um, they just instituted the, the paid model for, for professional services. Um, and I think that they held off for as long as they could, but they, they, they just instituted it. And, and I will tell you that the camera companies are all very, very healthy right now. Um, financially, no one's going out of business. I hear all this stuff all the time. Um, everybody's doing just fine, at least in the big four. Um, Olympus is having a tough time because they're only 2% of the marketplace and Pentax is having a tough time because they're even less. Um, but they've all found their niche and they're very happy being a small company 
Um, and I will tell you that in my opinion, there's no such thing as a bad camera being made today. They all have different features and different functions and they appeal to different groups of people. Um, but the manufacturers are all um, very, very strong and uh, they just can't wait to get their supply chain back in order so that they can come out with some great, great new products. It's all these little components I'm told that are holding things up, but there will be a ton of new announcements in the second half of this, maybe in June, but throughout the rest of the year, tons, both from Canon, Nikon. Um, I have a conference call with Fuji tomorrow that we're going to learn about some things. I don't know what we're going to learn, um, but, but Sony never stops either. Sony never stops. Um, so there's going to be lots of really great things. And, and I think that all those are just really great for photographers. Um, whether, you, whether you buy that product or not, to see that technology always moving means that whatever it is that's on your wish list, you're not going to have to wait too long. It, you know, that's, so that's a good thing. That's awesome. Any other final questions for Burke before we uh, cut them loose? Don't all talk at one time now. <laughs> no, thanks for doing this. Well, thank you very much. And, and I will say that, you know, um, one of the things that we were used, used to be up against was sales tax. Um, PPA members often had resale licenses, so they didn't pay tax anyway, but not so much these days. I mean, that thing is uh, not nearly as, as prevalent as it was in the past. Yeah. So, you know, our, uh, the, the rules have changed for internet buying and pretty much everybody is charging sales tax these days. And what it's done is it's put us on an equal footing with, um, the big guys, yeah. you know, the big guys, uh, I will tell you that camera prices um, are pretty much the same everywhere. If you find a better deal, you know, if you, if you think, don't, please don't think you're a great internet shopper because you found a better deal on a camera after looking at 10 different websites and that 11th website had a good deal. Um, I, be worried, be worried about what it is that you might get. And if you ever have any questions, I don't care if you're buying from me or you bought, you found something on someplace, send us an email, pick up the phone and give us a call. We're happy to kind of fill you in. You know, why do I see this everywhere at this price, but I see it there for a better price. We will tell you because, um, you know, you just want to make sure that you get the right thing with the right warranty and, and all that kind of stuff. So we're on an equal footing. We would love the opportunity to help everyone as much as possible. Um, you know, we're, we're far from perfect, um, but we're, but we're trying and we want to do whatever we can ask us anything, contact us for anything. You won't offend us. Um, we want to help. Uh, and, and, and we hope not to offend you. We hope to help you in every way possible. I've so had, thank you I, very much. I've had a good experience with you. I traded up my D610 for a Z6 last year with you guys. And the other times I've worked with you have been great. So for anybody who hasn't used you. I would great. certainly encourage all of our Maryland PPA members to at least make Service photo, your first call if you're going to look for some camera gear versus going to yeah, that's a good idea to to New York or somebody else or Amazon or Best Buy, because I'm telling you, you know, I've bought two used lenses from them. I've bought and it's it's a great thing to do, and I have no problem running to Baltimore to get them, but uh, I mean they're local and they're like Burke said in his whole conversations that they're there for you, and you can call these other people on the phone and talk to them, but. You can't touch the product. You can't. Right. You can't get the sna the snazzy responses that Burke will give you when you walk in the front door. So I mean, it's it's important that they come come see you guys. At least make them your first call before you decide to buy something else. Because if he's out of stock, he can't help you. But I've been I've been very fortunate to have everything I needed there, and um, happy to walk out of the, the place with it. I mean, you know, your your staff is really knowledgeable. Uh, me being a former Ritz employee, I I really appreciate that. So. You know, I encourage all of our Maryland members to just you know, reach out to you guys first, please. Well, thank you very much. We really, really, really appreciate it. And, and I would tell you, if, if anybody's not on our email list, get on our email list, because once we can have events, we are absolutely going to have events from every manufacturer. They can't wait to come in our store and help us and, and throw these things, uh, throw great events at, you know, breweries or maybe in our store or wherever. So We'll just let you, we want to keep everybody informed and, uh, you know, get back to life as yep. we know it and have a lot of fun and promote photography. So that's the name of the game. And Thanks for, so I'm much. 
I'm going to personally invite you when we come live at Maryland PBA to get you out and talk to us live as well. So talk to the membership um, when yeah. you can. So, Would thank love you to very do much it. for all okay. tonight. I appreciate it. Everybody, thank you. thank you for showing up. Thank you. Yep. Thanks. Thanks so thank much. You, Danny. Good night, everybody. Bert.